very happy uh, uh, to have such a crowd and I'm very happy that a lot of people um, are connected to, to each other and so I'm really pleased that um, the the atmosphere that we have for this event is is really just quite something so I want to I'm Dan Rundy. I um, am the co-director of the U.S. Leadership and Development Project here at CSIS, and I'm also the Schreier Chair in Global Analysis. I want to welcome you all here today to CSIS. We're launching a new report, Seizing the Opportunity, Strengthening Capacity at the State Department, USAID, and MCC around public-private partnerships. Uh, this is the first of several reports over the next several months that will be released under the CSIS Project on U.S. Leadership and Development, which I co-direct with Joanna Nesseth, and uh, the U.S. Uh, project, leadership and Development Project has been stood up in partnership with Chevron, who, which is a company that really understands the power of partnership and uh, is also somebody that, an organization that, um, that we've been really pleased to work with over the last uh, six months here and have a longer standing relationship uh, going back several years in the energy sector and health and, and, other, and other areas. But in, the, in particular, it's been so great to work with Chevron on, on these development issues over the last, over the last six months. So. Uh, but I think what is uh, the bottom line of the report that you have in your hands is that on the good news side, U.S. government agencies have made considerable progress in the last 10 years on building partnerships with the private sector, with the nonprofit sector. Uh, but we are running up against a limit of what can be done with, within a system where we're having to use workarounds and uh, there's going to be significant process and organ organizational change that's going to be needed. Uh, the intellectual arguments about working in partnership have been won uh, for the most part. It's now, I like using the term, I don't use it in the report because I was told to take it out, but I'm going to use it in this audience. It's now politically correct to talk about working in partnership with others. If you're the head of the World Bank, if you're the head of the IFC, if you're the head of DFID, you now have to talk about it. It's now something you have to talk about if you're a development leader. Whether or not you make it a priority or not, or whether or not you make the systemic changes to, to allow it to happen is another question. But it, it's now, the good news is, is folks like Holly Wise, fo leaders like Henrietta Four, leaders in the private sector like Neville Isdell, have now helped win the intellectual argument that we have to work across sectors to solve societal problems. That is the good news. Um, uh, and, and I think that um, we have, I think the other side of the good news is we have excellent senior leadership at the State Department, USAID, and MCC that understand the importance and the power of partnership. Uh, Secretary of State Clinton totally gets this. Her speech uh, in 2009 at the Global Philanthropy Forum was fantastic. Her more recent speech at the Economic Club of New York about this, it just, it under, it just underlines how she understands this at a DNA level. Um, we also have uh, Rajiv Shah's a speech 10 days ago on the 10th anniversary of the Global Development Alliance. Fantastic speech, and I recommend everybody read it. And I'll read some experts, excerpts from it a little bit later. Um, so we have excellent top-level leadership. And then we have some great uh, folks who are actually pushing this at the, at the institutional level. We have Maura O'Neill here. Uh, we're very fortunate that you're here, Maura. Thanks, and thanks for your leadership on this. And so we have some very strong, thoughtful people who are seeking to drive change. And what we need to do is help make some process changes and some culture changes so that uh, the leadership, with the leadership that's there, that we can take it to the next level because we're going we're gonna to have to be working more closely across sectors and we're going to need to uh, fix these things. So uh, let me just underline one more time on this, on the needs improvement side. Uh, our friends in government are running into this, these problems of systems, incentives, and planning models that were designed for another era where 80% of the resources to developing countries came from governments. Uh, and we're running up against the, the limits of institutional workarounds and small fixes. Uh, in many cases, uh, working in partnerships uh, with others should be the starting point of our work in developing countries, not an afterthought or something that's built at the very end of a very lengthy internal conversation within a bureaucracy. Uh, I want to recognize a few people here who've been central to our success. Uh, first is Neville Isdell, who you'll hear more from in a few minutes. Um, uh, and I also want to recognize Cedric Sussman and Wayne Lord, uh, both of Georgia State University and the World Affairs Council of Atlanta. They've flown up with Neville from Atlanta to be with us today, and we're very grateful. Uh, I also need to recognize Holly Wise, who's been a senior advisor on this report and convened the working group sessions for us here at CSIS. All of you know Holly as the founder of the Global Development Alliance Initiative, and we'd not be here today without Holly's vision and efforts over many years, both in government and now outside of it. I also want to thank Anna Sato Carson and Eleanor Coates for their efforts as contributing authors uh, to who helped make this report possible. And now I want to introduce Henrietta Four. 
An administrator four was someone who has always grasped the power of partnership and made it one of her signature efforts during her time at USAID. We're very fortunate to have administrator four as a CSIS trustee and a trusted thought partner for the CSIS project on US leadership and development. Administrator four, the floor is yours. Neville. And uh, I also see in the front row Rob Mossbacher, uh, our very good friend who used to head up OPIC. So uh, let me, on behalf of John Hamry, uh, welcome all of you to CSIS. John Hamry is our president. And uh, this morning, what we've been thinking with Dan Rundy and Neville is that we want you to think differently. We really want you to think about US leadership in development in a new way. You will hear from our speakers today that they actually want to rewire our brains. And so we want you to sit back and think about rewiring, how you think about public-private partnerships. And part of this is um, to think about what we, the United States, can do. What if the United States decided to lead in developing public-private partnerships? And what if we said that 50% of our development portfolio would be in public-private partnerships. What would that mean in the world today? Would it mean uh, that we do more things that were strategic for U.S. interests? Would it mean that we would be more results-oriented? Would it mean that we could bring more technologies and more long-term thinking to our development portfolios and to developing countries around the world? But if our answer is yes, then go to what Dan just spoke about. How do we get there? What do we do in rewiring our minds and rewiring our operations and our organization? Today we are marking the release of this wonderful program, and you've just heard about all the people who have contributed to it. But many of you have, I see, our resources in this brochure. And it is the first white paper on US leadership and development. So let's think through what the second white paper might say. And can we move this forward? Can we move our thinking to a place where we really create something that is important and meaningful for the United States in leadership? You've been hearing about some good companies. Uh, you've heard about Chevron, who has great programs in Angola, uh, helping thousands of smallholder farmers. And they have another one coming in Nigeria. And you will hear the stories of Coca-Cola with Neville. But there are hundreds and hundreds of American companies that are like this, who in partnership with government and with nonprofit organizations could create enormous value. So how do we do this? So please think with us. We also are trying to think through how to make the case to the American people. Because all of us know that the economic growth and opportunities for our partners around the world is something that also brings revenues and profits and jobs to America. So it's something that's good for America. And let's think about that one. This past week, uh, we have begun celebrating USAID's 50th anniversary. And this week, there will be more celebrations. But as you think about the beginnings of USAID, and it was born in the Marshall Plan, you see that we have five decades of public-private partnerships to build on. So let's think forward into the future, let's start at the beginning, and let's create something really meaningful for US leadership in the world. Thank you, and welcome everyone. Thanks. Okay, I'm gonna ask uh, Neville Isdell to come up to the, to the dais with me, and we're, we'll have a, we're gonna have a conversation. And That is that, I think that's Coca-Cola up here. It's, the, if you want the commercial, it's Coke Zero. It's Coke Zero, exactly. But it, we're really uh, very uh, grateful that uh, Neville Isdell's flown up from Atlanta uh, this morning to be with us. And uh, Neville, as all of you know, is the former uh, chairman and CEO of the Coca-Cola company, but he's also a CSIS trustee and is, was really instrumental in helping us launch this conversation er, earlier this year. And 
The context uh, that he helped us launch it around is the concept of connected capitalism. He's just come out with a book. It was launched last week. I recommend you all buy it on Amazon.com, which I did actually the other day. And uh, it's a wonderful book. Uh, and it's called uh, Inside Coca-Cola, A CEO's Life Story of Building the World's Most Popular Brand. And uh, uh, there's a chapter on, on connected capitalism in the book, and there's some very, really interesting stories that I'm hoping he'll, he'll tell a couple uh, for, for this audience uh, today. Uh, to this conversation, Neville brings several hats. He was, as I said, the former chairman and CEO of the Coca-Cola Company. He's also uh, a CSIS trustee. He's, he's co-chair of something called the Investment Climate Facility that I hope he'll, he'll tell us a little bit about. Uh, he was also former chairman of the International Business Leaders Forum, and he was also, he's also, you're currently chairman of the World, World Wildlife Federation. Vice chair. Vice chairman. Okay. Uh, let me start with, at the height of the financial crisis back in 2009, you coined the term connected capitalism as a response to the crisis that, that you saw out, out in the world. And uh, you talk about it as well in the, in the book about as the three key elements of the triangle of sustainability, business, nonprofits, and governments work more closely together in the future, there should be an acknowledgement of the strengths each brings to the table. Business brings efficiency and profit, and that's not something of which we should be ashamed. Maybe you could just tell us a little bit about both what prompted you to talk about connected capitalism or, 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 or describe the phenomenon of connect, connected capitalism, but also a little bit about this concept of the triangle of sustainability. Well, the, the, the first piece was a real belief that, to some degree, we are facing a, a crisis of capitalism. And I, you don't have to go much further than look at people that are camped out in the parks around America to, to understand that. And I think since I, the original speech with the Council of Foreign Relations about two and a half years ago, and I think that that situation has actually worsened uh, over the last two and a half years. You've only got to look at the level of trust in government and the level of trust in business. Uh, any of the data will show, will show you that there's a significant level, not only of dissatisfaction, but of distrust. And what I said at that time, what I would say now, is that is undermining the, the ability of both governments and businesses, but also in terms of the relationship with what I call civil society. Um, it, it, is, it is undermining the trust in the basic system that has brought so many people out of poverty over the last 100 years. And that whilst the, uh, the people who are camping are probably not articulating very well a, a solution, there, and some people denigrate what they're doing by saying, you know, it's, uh, you know, the, the one in Atlanta ended up being in a hip hop comp concert, so, you know, you can. You can find stories to laugh about uh, some of the things that they're doing. But right behind that is a massive, massive amount of dissatisfaction that actually identifies with the, the outpouring that's taking place in those parks. And we've done a lot to earn that distrust. The, what the financial system managed to do in terms of chasing short-term profits and not thinking about broader welfare. And also, then you go back to the Enrons and, uh, and, and the like. Um, and capitalism has not behaved well. And yet, underneath all of that, there's been something else that's been happening. And that is the breaking down of these silos. Because one of the problems has been governments be working in a silo. NGOs, to some degree, have been working in a silo. And uh, you know, I agree with, with what you say, with the optimism, with what happened with regard to developmental agencies working with business. But I think, in, in general terms, still in the silo. And, uh, and business, in a, in a way, the same way. And yet, if you, put the, if you put those power together against some of the world's really great problems, each brings something to the party that in a coordinated way can actually make a difference. So, so let me try and give you a concrete example, um, or examples. And I, I'm going to move away. Coca-Cola uh, works with the WWF on water. Uh, one of the things that that demonstrates is that the Coca-Cola has chosen water as its number one issue when I was there, and it's continuing. 
And that's because it is actually integral to strategy. And when I was asked the, you know, the question from someone with a Milton Friedman view about the only role of business is actually to extract a profit, and therefore the welfare will flow, and they challenged me on the money that the Coca-Cola company was spending on, on water. I don't have a bottle here, but I picked up the Coke, and I said, but don't you think we should worry about something that's a key ingredient? And I have never had the question asked me again, because it makes sense, because it makes strategic sense. So it, it, this is not philanthropy. This is not normal corporate social responsibility. This is moving to look at the societal impact that you have on a, on a very broad basis and addressing the problem. Firstly, you address the problem in terms of your own particular footprint. What are you doing that is damaging the earth? And if you, you look at the Coke website, they will be water neutral by 2020. Uh, uh, so th there's a clear goal. The next thing is you have to look at your handprint, your supply chain. Uh, and that spreads into things like, uh, I mean, sugar, for example, is an extremely thirsty crop. What can be done to reduce the, uh, the, the amount of water that sugar needs? And there's a, now a, uh, a new sugar out there called Bon Sucre, which has been developed. It uses 40% less water. Uh, yes, it's initially more expensive, but, but that, that, again, is addressing that issue. And then you have the legitimacy as a business to get into blueprint, which is actually the debate with governments to, to, act, to look at what is happening with regard to water policies worldwide, what's happening with pricing, uh, et, et cetera. Is it, is it, a, is it a, a human right uh, to be free for any usage, or is it only a human right in terms of a, a, a finite amount that you could, you could give to someone? So I use, I use that as an example because then you're starting engaging all piece, three pieces of the triangle. And when I talk about civil societies, it is not just NGOs and governmental agencies, also academia. That's why I'm working with Georgia State University. Um, uh, so it, it, it's civil society in its, in its broader, broader context. And if we are then working together against these problems, we are going to connect again with the real problems and issues of society to earn what you might call the social license to operate. And therefore, the, the connectivity that goes back to the old days when the mayor of the town actually was the local businessman and everyone knew that he was, he, he was really engaged in the welfare of, of, of his particular uh, town uh, and of the, the residents there. People do not look at business, and today they don't even look at governments sometimes as actually looking after their welfare. Now, the alternative. The only other alternative is a more egalitarian spread. And certainly, there have been a big disconnect in terms of what the top 1% is earning and, and the rest. And I was part of that top 1%. But, but, I, but I think that, that is highlighting the problem. But um, it, 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 it also just is, is just something that accentuates the frustration. But what we have to do is, is to be shown to be really engaged with society to build, up our, build back our credibility, as we've, which we've destroyed so badly. So that's the broad, the broad context. And, and let me just say one last thing, because in part of, as part of all of these, these dialogues, about six months ago, I had down in Atlanta, uh, actually it was, again, Georgia State World Affairs Council put it together, I had Helene Gale of CARE and Larry Summers, former Treasury Secretary Summers, uh, myself on a stage, so representing those three pieces of the, of the pyramid. And I was amazed to hear Larry Summers come out so very strongly in saying that actually the partnership as he sees it, and this is the way I see it, between business and NGOs, and I'll come back to some examples of that in a minute, is actually much stronger. That, that leg of the t uh, is working much better. Only with the developmental agencies do you see it working with government. But in the broader context of government, government is still in a legislative mode and in a punitive mode and not in a cooperative mode. They, they have not seen where that multiplier can take place. And as I say, the exceptions are the likes of USAID, of DFID, which, which you wor work with. But those are specific agencies sort of hived off to go and do that work. And the main, the main, piece, the main center of government is not actually engaged in the way that their, their own agencies are engaged. 
there were a couple quotes from the book that I found fascinating. One is that you were trained as a social worker in college and that yet you went into business. And you say here that as corporations evolved, I had a far greater opportunity at Coca-Cola to affect true social change globally than I ever would have as a social worker in Africa. Capitalism now provides that opportunity. No longer are other lines drawn so distinctly. Could you just? Well, that's about it. But uh, I mean, my, my old. <laughs> uh, read the book. Right, uh, exactly. I mean, when my old sociology prop learned I was working for Coca-Cola, uh, he said, what? <laughs> uh, and that is exactly what I said to him. <clears throat> but uh, because I do think that a, for, to be a 21st century company, so that's another, another part of, of my thinking. Society is looking at the values that a business has, the value proposition. They're looking behind the brand. What do you stand for and what do you do? So the, the purchasing, de purchasing decision is just not made uh, on the, the, the original proposition of the brand. And uh, it, it's a much broader context. And particularly if you're Coca-Cola, where the, the name on the bottle is the name on the building. Uh, they, they, want, they want to know what you stand for. We see that all the time. We see that in terms of, of blogs. We see that in terms of what comes across uh, with, on the Facebook uh, pages of companies. And we also see that within companies themselves. And I think the most uh, encouraging thing that I saw as we enhanced the sustainability agenda, um, I, I, and let me just reverse out a little bit, one of the five pillars in the strategy that we did in 2004, 2005, which continues, was planet. That P, the five Ps, planet, came from the top 150 managers saying, this is something we have to do differently going forward. So, so it, it, it's there. And, it, and there are many other companies who've come to the same conclusion. And that's, that's where I'm optimistic, because I, I, I think we've crossed uh, a bridge as business and realize that the, the, the Friedman-esque view, the Friedman view, I is no longer sufficient. Just, you, you tell a story about when you were chairman and CEO of Coca-Cola, op you, you, Coca-Cola opened a $25 million bottling plant in Kabul, and it created 350 jobs, and you got criticism from somebody saying, well, you should have spent that $25 million to build a hospital, and you, you had, a, you had a, I thought a, a thoughtful response to that criticism. Well, because the multiplier, uh, you know, you, you need a hospital, and we're not in that business. We don't have any skills, knowledge, and expertise in that, in that area whatsoever. Um, but it was, you, you, you have to get the engine of the economy going if you're going to long term be able to provide the services to the overall population. And what we would have done with a hospital would have been something that was philanthropic. What we did with a business was something that's going to be there for a more than 100 years and provide jobs for more than 100 years. You're also co-chair of the Investment Climate Facility. And I think you've, you've done a significant work through that, through that uh, role. And I think your, your co-chair is the former president of Tanzania, mm -hmm. looking at the, the investment climate in Africa in terms of business, the business enabling environment. Could you talk a little bit about that and, and why that's important? I, I spent 26 years of my life in Africa, so I, I, I've been back there. My fifth time is going to be next week. Um, Just this year? This year, yeah. Uh, fifth time this year. This, uh, I'll be back this, uh, this coming week. And I, I, I think that Africa's on the move. Um, uh, I, I'm largely talking sub-Saharan Africa, but very different changes in, in North Africa. But I think that's positive as well. But I really, the, uh, the investment plan facility is, is it's focused on, on Africa generally, but most of our projects are sub-Saharan Africa. The, the, the idea is basically this, and it did come out of, the, of Glen Eagles in 2005, that by undertaking micro-reform of government process, that that is better than some of the top-down World Bank-type programs, IMF-type programs that get through, are supposed to get through the government down to bringing about change, but which gets stuck in an existing bureaucracy which is often corrupt. Um, and that is one of the, the, the real problems. So the ICF was put together to try and look at how you can enable the investment climate. In other words, what do we do? Um, 
we work with, with African governments with very strong protocols in reforming commercial courts, business licensing, um, uh, dispute resolution, we do land registration, uh, we do uh, reform of customs, uh, a whole range of, of these minor interventions, which if you look at, we handed over three projects in Rwanda in June. I was in Rwanda for the handing over the projects. One of those uh, projects is one for your registration of your business. You can now in Rwanda register a business in 24 hours online. Or it'll take you three days if you go through, the, come in and do the process. It used to take the average person who wanted to register their business. I, I, sorry, there's a leg I missed. By the way, when you register your business, your business registration number becomes your VAT number, and, your, and it becomes your tax number. So now you don't have to go and see three different agencies. You don't have to, do, you don't have to line up. You don't have to come in if you, uh, if you're right in a rural area. If you can, you can get access to a computer. You can actually do it online. And the average person who had to register business was taking them something in the order of 45 to 50 days effort, but it would take them about nine months time. Why do you have an informal economy? No one did it. And that informal economy then breeds corruption. The number of business registrations from being about somewhere in the order of 120 a year is now up in the thousands. It's going to be about 7,000 businesses registered this year, bringing them into the formal economy, paying, paying taxes. taxes, paying taxes, and taking out bribery and, and corruption. And it, it's, it's the view that a whole lot of interventions like that, uh, for example, the commercial courts in, in Zambia were on a manual system. The clerk of the court would record the case sometimes six weeks afterwards. You can imagine the accuracy of the facts. You can imagine the other opportunities to change the facts. It's now completely digital. It's now recorded and digitalized, and it's available to all of the parties, including public, the very next morning. Um, there was a backlog on the commercial courts of somewhere in the order of 370 cases, taking about 18 months for the average case to be solved. The backlog is gone, and uh, cases are going through the uh, courts now at nine months, and we're trying to, trying to improve that. So I, I, those are just two examples of uh, projects that are actually completed and the sort of success that we're able to have. And it, it's an interesting partnership because <coughs> I'm, uh, I'm representing, sort of, as it were, the business side of it, but then Ben, because um, governments have to contribute 25% of the cost. Um, ben is the guy who then works with the president if things go off the rails. Well, I, it just seems to me that what you've been describing are a variety of collaborations and partnerships and that for a, a connected business such as Coca-Cola, it's become an important skill set to be able to, to, to work in collaboration across civil society and government to, to achieve its goals. And what, what would you like to see in terms of government? What, what sorts of behaviors would you like to see government do to, to be able to respond to the opportunity that companies like Coca-Cola offer in terms of as a connected capitalism enterprise, if you are a response, a, a response, you have a very interesting, you don't call it a corporate social responsibility, you call it a, social, a socially responsible corporation, right? And maybe as a socially responsible corporation, how, how, do, how do governments take advantage of socially the, the activities of socially responsible corporations? Well, let let, let me tell you, uh, I'll put one of my other hats on, which is uh, the World Wildlife Fund, uh, vice chair of that. The uh, World Wildlife Fund, in a way, took a risk in terms of engaging with, with business, in terms of their own community, um, solving some of the problems. But uh, what, what they've done is called the Markets Program. And um, Jason Clay, uh, who runs the program at WWF, and you might, you might want to have a look on the web, actually, on um, um, what do you call it? Uh, that escaped me for a minute. Uh, the seventeen-minute uh, programs. YouTube. No, no. Ted. 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 Yeah, on Ted. Uh, Jason Clay. If you if you have a look at that. But what what he's done is he's he said okay, and this is this is obviously on sustainability. What are the fifteen key? areas that we need, that need to focus on with regard to sustainability and, and 
specifically, obviously, agricultural products. Um, but water was one. But palm oil, let me take a non-Coca-Cola example. Palm oil is, a, is another one. And as he's taken those 15, he's looked at the companies that make up you know, around 20, 30, 40, or 50 percent of the global trade in those goods. And he said, if, if the WWF partners with them and gets them to commit to sustainable palm oil, that will almost overnight fundamentally change the whole dimension with regard to palm oil. And then be, able to be much better able to get to the bad actors, because there'll be good actors out there who are going to get the business, and the bad actors aren't going to get the business. So the likes, Unilever is going to, I think they are committed by the end of 2015, that there was going to be zero de deforestation with regard to palm oil for any of the palm oil that they source. And there is a whole new grouping being put together between a number of NGOs, not just WWF, and the uh, actually f five of the key users of palm oil in the world, representing about 40% of palm oil which is going to have certified palm oil. In other words, palm oil is certified that's not been, uh, uh, has n no incremental effect on deforestation. Um, and that, that, we believe, is the only way that we're going to save the forest in Borneo, because uh, that's been hacked away at a terrible rate. You're not going to stop the uh, acceleration of, of, uh, of palm oil consumption. So that group is also working on how you use land that's already been uh, denuded and destroyed, um, but where there, is, there actually are no palm oil uh, plantations, so that the virgin forest is not touched. We have time for a couple questions. I'm hoping uh, I see Christy Reagan, and I also see uh, there. I'm going to start with Christy. And I think, uh, Ellie, you've got a microphone. We're going to go ahead and we're going to have Christy ask the first question. Thank you. Um, Henrietta Four started it out, us out on such a great note, which was, let's think about what's next. And you, Neville, have said, let's make sure we're focused on real problems. So if I think about Occupy Wall Street, I think about one of the real problems that that's flagging is, of course, jobs. My question would be, can you envision the private sector taking the lead and putting together a public-private partnership that is focused explicitly on jobs? And if so, what would that look like? And because Dan Rundy's sitting there, I know I have to say, what's a pragmatic, concrete next step to make that happen? Well, you know, the, I, I, you, you can't just, the, the, you cannot create a job if there isn't something to be productively done. Uh, they don't get, they just don't get created out of, of thin air. So why uh, are the, the, the jobs not being created? I think point number one is that the level of uncertainty within business today is such that they are very loath to add any jobs to their current base and they are really stretching it with regard to current employees. I think people are working longer and harder and I think they're, they're trying to improve productivity uh, because they are, they're worried that they're worried about a double dip um, and they're worried they're going to have to just go into a, a, another uh, uh, series of, of layoffs. So the uncertainty that is there, and that is something that is, is in the hands of the policymakers. But, you know, we've, we've just seen another level of uncertainty. There was a report yesterday about in Europe. Uh, the reasons why employers, they did a survey, the reasons why they're, they're not hiring is they don't believe there's economic growth ahead. They think actually there's going to be a, a decline in the economic growth in the EU. And I think that's probably the case. And then you've got Greece blowing up again with the referendum. Um, so until we get the macro sorted out, you, you, you can't create jobs. And the second, the second thing is that uh, the level of, I mean, I, I, I'm, you know, I'm not a U.S. citizen, and I live in Barbados. I don't vote, so I, I, I don't, even, don't even live here. Uh, so I'm watching from afar uh, today, and I, I don't, 
represent any individual uh, company whatsoever. It's a private individual. But I have just seen regulation after regulation after regulation piled on top. And to get anything going today uh, in the U.S., to get a startup business, and we, all, we know that small businesses are the biggest generator of jobs, not just not the larger corporations. For the small businesses to get, to get going is much more difficult than you if you look across to Asia and you look to Brazil and the like. And I think we're seeing the, the epicenter of the global economy is very clearly moving east and south because that's where jobs are being created because they, they can be created much more easily. And it's not low wages. Um, it, it's the fact that this is why we're, we're trying to free up uh, Africa to be able to get the sort of barriers that are out there. But if you just look at what Singapore has done in a, in a deregulated eco economy with, with their, their openness and how they have they've built it. Um, that's, that's how you're going to do it. Then the, the last thing, and it's a long-term issue, but the jobs that are being created, I mean, there was a piece in NPR yesterday that uh, can't find truck drivers. Um, the, the farmers in Georgia, uh, because of what, what happened on the immigration uh, front. And admittedly, this is illegal labor, and that's a whole other issue. But they've had crops rotting because people who are unemployed don't want to go work in fields anymore. Um, so it, it, the, there are, it, there's an expectation issue. But the, the problem, I think the bigger problem is education. And if we're going to, if we're going to compete in this, in this world, uh, this globalized world, the, the educational system uh, needs to, be, and I'm talking about the not not I mean obviously at that the best universities in the world are in the United States, but it's at the it's the next level that where the problem exists, and you've got China turning out more engineers uh, every year than just the, the rest of the world put together. They're going to have that intellectual capital. We've got to re we've got to re recreate that, and uh, it, it's an issue in Western Europe as well. You'll hear employers saying that they cannot get people with the skills. Um, so. The, a lot of the unemployed people either have got uh, skills that are redundant or they haven't had skills and been given the skills in the first place. I want to hear from Maura O'Neill. So I don't, have, I don't have a bright answer for you because I, I think it's a very complex issue. Unfortunately, it'll be the, the last question, but Maura. Um, thank you very much. I'm Maura O'Neill. I'm the Chief Innovation Officer at USAID, and a couple weeks ago we gave Coca-Cola our 10th year anniversary um, Global um, Corporate or Global Partnership Award. So thank you for your leadership because a big part of that. Henrietta so. gave me one, too. <laughs> <laughs> but we gave it for the decade, so, okay. <laughs> so we appreciate it. We I built on the I didn't one stick around that long. So I okay. know. Uh, we just built it. But we also believe in continuous improvement, I think, as any organization needs to. And so what advice do you have um, for us and for our colleagues at MCC and uh, and OPIC and others to looking forward how we can be better partners with uh, private business, particularly in the P&L and sustainability area? Well, I wish you could persuade the U.S. government to do what the U.K. government did in ring fencing DFID um, in terms of funding. I think that's a I think that's th that's one issue, and I think the pri actually the, the 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 private sector uh, again as an individual view uh, should be able to help you in terms of uh, going to going to the hill with regard to that that funding because I think it's uh, I think what we do together the number of programs we, that we've had we do together they they make a, a real uh, a real difference, um, but somehow or other uh, the, the the problem of the debate is that everyone is looking at share of a static pie, okay? As if the, 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 that was the battle that we have to have. And that's where you get into this jobs being sent overseas, et, et, et cetera. Um, I, I know a company that, that announced uh, investments in, 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 in China that was, that was attacked. Uh, why are you putting the jobs in China? Well, the truth was it was a, a, a product that you could never make in this country and profitably make in China because of the freight costs. It, 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 it had to be manufactured locally. And in fact, uh, they've got factories in different parts of the U.S. because you can't have one factory. It just, uh, in the U.S., you need more factories because of the freight, freight cost. But no one thought about what that employment would mean back 
at head office in the U.S. in terms of, of, of adding jobs back there. And how, in fact, the wealth that's created of that was actually distributed to shareholders who were mostly U.S. funds and how that was going to generate other activity. So it, it is inevitable that China is going to be the world's largest economy. Um, it's great for us, for China to be the world's largest economy because it's going to enlarge the pie. Our share, Western Europe's share, is going to go down. The issue is, uh, how are we going to grab a sufficient share of that growth in order to accelerate the growth of our GDP for our, for our population? That, that's what it's all about. And you've seen countries do that effectively uh, over, over the, I mean, I don't want to, I'm not trying to compare the U.S. with Switzerland, but, but you look at the like of Switzerland where, um, uh, you know, the, the, again, intellectual capital is part of it. Um, but but they, they have managed to stay, to stay relevant, and their share has gone down. I mean, uh, they used to be in the top 20, funnily enough, a um, hundred years ago. Uh, but I mean, now they're number 80, but that doesn't matter to the Swiss. And, and that's the sort of mindset, uh, rather than, I hear the question, how do we stop China? You don't stop China. You see how you manage to get as much of that growth Back into the back into the U.S., but back into the U.S. by intellectual capital, not by regulation. We're going to have to stop there. Neville, thank you so much for being with us this morning, and please join me in thanking uh, Neville Isdell. Okay. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. We're going to have a, a slight. Uh, step uh, set change because we're going to put a couple more chairs up here so we're going to have a little bit of a of a uh, we're going to just uh, as we as we put the chairs up I'm going to introduce um, Holly Wise who's going to make some some remarks uh, to provide some context for the report um, you know probably Holly, Holly probably more than anyone else has helped uh, see this change in mindset happen uh, in Washington on working more collaboratively in international development uh, and uh, the, it, when I, uh, Holly was my first boss in Washington at USAID, and uh, it was her vision and leadership that helped make the Global Development Alliance a reality, and I think is the reason that one, is one of the people that's most responsible for all of us being here in this room today. Um, I want to just read uh, a couple excerpts from uh, Dr. Shah's most recent speech because I think it reflects the mindset that, that Holly and others has helped, helped to achieve over the last 10 years. Let me just read a couple things from a speech from a couple weeks ago. The sectors we most associate with development work, healthcare, agriculture, and water, are dominated by private sector activity. If we're going to encourage truly sustainable, broad-based economic growth in developing countries, we have to do a far better job working with private firms, be they domestic or foreign, established or entrepreneurial. I know this is uneasy territory for many in the development community. Um, then he goes on, and uh, those early experiences um, working in, with the private sector earlier on in the 70s and 80s uh, led to a deep mistrust of the private sector by uh, developing countries and the development community alike. As a result, our community became far less comfortable partnering with the private sector. So today, if you're a development expert working in the field, you probably understand a longitudinal study better than a balance sheet. And you probably know the names of more NGO leaders than local CEOs. But the modern corporation has a much more enlightened understanding about the aligned interests it shares with the development community. And finally, he says, uh, the development community must step out of its comfort zone and imagine new linkages with the private sector firms. I'm not talking about partnership for partnership's sake. I'm not talking about corporate social responsibility or charity work. I'm not talking about photo opportunities. A amen, by the way. Um, I'm talking about helping support the work of markets that can deliver profits and create opportunity for women, minorities, and the poor. We must partner with the private sector much more deeply from the start, instead of treating companies as just another funding source for our development work. In short, we must embrace a new wave of creative enlightened capitalism. I don't know if he was reading Neville's book or not, but, uh, but I think, uh, I think it, it reflects sort of a perspective from government. So um, I don't think we'd have heard a speech like that 20 or 30 years ago from a USAID administrator. And I think Holly Wise had a lot to do with um, to this, this mindset that's reflected, I think, in those, in those remarks. Um, so I'm going to uh, turn the floor over uh, to Holly Wise to, to give some additional commentary. Holly, the floor is yours. <laughs> Good morning, and uh, thanks, Dan. As um, 
one Secretary of State would say, well, it takes a village. So I um, am so uh, happy to be associated with, with uh, friends and colleagues who have uh, not only been working on partnerships for a long time, but, uh, but who worked on this particular report that's being launched today. And I think um, it sets the stage not only for some good thinking, but uh, hopefully for some, some good uh, collaborative work over the next year in CSIS and hopefully in the development community as well. Several have reminded already that uh, USAID is celebrating a birthday just now, 50 years, and uh, GDA, the Global Development Alliance, also coincidentally is 10 years old, just about now. Um, it's been suggested that we've been doing partnerships in some form or fashion over the whole 50 years, and then been doing them on steroids for the last 10 years, and um, going forward, want to do a whole lot more of that. Um, I think it's important, for again, to ground us in, in why did GDA come forward and why is there a continuation of, of, of interest in this? Why have other government agencies also started doing this? And how does it fit in the context of, of what other donors and international organizations are doing? When, when we, 10-ish uh, years ago, uh, thought about uh, the, the world in which we were operating, we realized um, that we had a, a Truman era business model in a, in a you know, diff very different uh, environment in which we were working. Um, what was different? The, everything was different. In the 1960s when AID was formed, there weren't a lot of people in the sense of organizations that were forward deployed who were doing development work. There wasn't nearly the FDI, there weren't remittances, there weren't new wealth foundations, there weren't a whole lot of things which had become kind of standard fare even as of 10 years ago. Uh, and the, the pie wasn't so big. Um, Dan mentioned that the public sector share, we were the majority shareholder, but uh, it was 71% of a $5.1 billion pie of, of US transfers. In 2009, uh, that pie was significantly bigger and, and sliced differently. ODA, uh, Official Development Assistance, was 13% of a $226 billion pie. And uh, the, in the Truman era, when many of the structures of foreign aid and public-private consultation were, were created, as I mentioned, there were just a handful of NGOs, and now there were a, a multitude of them. Um, way back in 1999, a global estimate that was that there were over 2 million NGOs, a million just in India alone. <laughs> that probably says as much about government activity as it does about NGO flourishing. But, um, it got us to thinking with the emergence of new actors and new resources and complex global challenges, this partnership imperative became increasingly evident. So 10 years ago, the USAID formed the GDA, which was followed several years later by partnership initiatives at PEPFAR and MCC, and most recently at the Department of State. USAID can claim credit for having put together over 1,000 partnerships with 3,000 partners and leveraging of $9 billion in resources for the world's poor. Now, despite some impressive numbers, not a lot has changed over the last decade in terms of roles and timing of engagement and the type and method of financing partnerships. Despite really revolutionary changes in how we communicate and who knows and does what, who funds development work externally and how those funds flow, there's only been incremental change in the development of incentives, skills, and mechanisms to engage the private sector. There's not been a substantial leapfrogging or a sea change in roles and responsibilities of state and non-state actors in the international development game. Partners are still engaged closer to the end of pipe than at the source of analysis, strategic planning, consideration of alternatives, and framing of approaches. Partnership is not, as you might think it should be, the de default setting on the international assistance machinery, with the assumption that the US government should be the funder of last, not first resort. The governance structures do not share power and voice with agility. Partners are not co-equals in determining rules of engagement and measuring results. We talk about the assets of the private sector, technology, business processes, supply chain networks, voice, managerial practices, people, cash, cash. Are we 
leveraging them on the government side in the most useful way. We've been talking for a little while about uh, Partnership 2.0, Alliances 2.0, lots of, of software um, references. Um, well, what's it going to take to do Alliances 2.0? Where is this one plus one plus one of the public, private, and not-for-profit profit sectors coming together uh, and equaling seven or 10 or 50? Where is that going to come from? How is that going to come about? What, what should we be doing in seeking, really seeking synergy and scaling and sustainability? I would suggest to you that Alliance 2.0 requires systems change interagency as well as public-private co-creation and blended financing. Now there are a few bright spots and as I said a lot has happened and I'm very proud to have been associated with the work that has uh, taken place already and the things that are coming. Uh, Dr. O'Neill has put together a, a Google Earth mapping of partnerships across the globe which is a pretty whiz-bang little, um, little platform, and I think that that's a illustrative of, huh, technology, yeah, and uh, open source information, yeah, and inviting people forward. That's, a, that's an interesting thing. Take a look at that, right? How do we access it? Just go to the USAID website. There's there. There you go. Um, a Partnership for Growth initiative is uh, engaging across agencies, state, aid, MCC, OPIC, in four countries. El Salvador, Ghana, Philippines, and Tanzania. The good news here is that it's, a, it's something like a whole of government approach um, with a country focus to, uh, to, to try and hone um, collaboration. But does this focus, does this uh, attention to the deep dive on a couple of countries um, also have the same effort toward fixing the, as I would say, the plumbing issues, looking at the way in which they're going to work together uh, both between agencies and, and with the recipients. Um, the African Ag Development Fund is, is another bright spot for me. This involves JP Morgan and, uh, and a guarantee facility that USAID has that will provide equity and support to grow African ag agricultural enterprises. This is a reasonable attempt to blend finance and, and leverage assets in a different way. Other bright spots that could be uh, copied or, or improved upon, things like CRADAs, uh, the co Cooperative Research and Development Agreements of, of USDA and, and others that have done things like uh, helped uh, to work with uh, the cocoa industry to map the cocoa genome, to uh, do a, a research on uh, plant and uh, pest issues in, in developing uh, as inputs to new products. Um, uh, ARPAs, uh, these advanced uh, research uh, project agency agreements or, or setups that allow for uh, sharing of, of intellectual property and joint R&D um, and a real blending between government and the private sector with, um, with an understanding about commu uh, commercialization of uh, public-private early investment outcomes. Um, and is that how can we mainstream to do more of that in international economic assistance? And if you like the idea of that. One of our panelists is pretty smart about those sorts of issues. Um, but basically, we're still talking about a cash business. And I think that the, the important thing is to think about how do we move beyond this cash business with only pay-as-you-go provisions? Um, can we use forward contracts as collateral more, uh, more readily um, to leverage impact investment, whether in agriculture value chain development partnerships or reagent supply work in HIV in Kenya. These are promising. The potential use of first loss risk sharing, credit enhancements, term debt, and even equity hold the potential to stretch public dollars and use them most strategic. Catalytic financing is what's going to really leverage internally as well as, as externally. Another bright spot is USAID's Grand Challenge for Development program. Uh, which engages in contests like cl collaboration based on USG-wide prize authority granted under the America Competes Act. Another bright spot I would suggest to you is the Alliance for Clean Cookstoves, which leverages leadership and interagency effort of state, AID, HHS, EPA, 
OPIC, and others with real money and a rather awesome team of Julia Roberts and Hillary Clinton. Um, what I like about this is that it, is, uh, it has a laser focus. There's a technology component to it. It ha has high visibility. I can explain it to my mom. And there's real money. Development Innovation Ventures will attempt to make equity-like investments in promising solutions. This is another USAID activity. Now, are these bright spots that I'm suggesting to you material and mainstream? Are they cottage industries and rounding errors on the real money and effort? These activities, some pilot in nature, though, I think will help in organizational learning. They'll foster added innovation and build skills, confidence, and commitment to new ways of doing business on the government side, as well as with their partners, and most importantly, make a difference for the world's poor. But are they still more boutique than big box store? So what's the way forward? There are some issues uh, and some opportunities for, I think, uh, that are described very nicely in the report. And you will have added thoughts about them. But there's some clusters of issue areas that I think are worth mentioning. Planning, procurement, governance, and monitoring and evaluation. That's all. Um, <laughs> in planning, public and private sector parties are still doing their own analyses, not joint studies, and then determining uh, activities, action, often in isolation. How about open sourcing some of these many governmental studies through co collaboration with private partners? Procurement is still a major barrier to alliance resourcing. Grants and contracts are primary vehicles, and these are intended either to transfer resources to external parties or support vendor relationships. USAID has experimented with collaboration agreements in a minimal fashion, but advances in these areas are of paramount importance. Governance is not well developed. Someone said the, uh, there's a lot of attention on the big check or the signing ceremony. And then the what happens after you're married part is, um, is a little well, less well understood. So it either follows a traditional grantor-grantee model, or it tends to lay out roles and responsibilities in M MOU. Many of the larger partnerships use management reporting and accountability frameworks that are based on UN models. Not that they're necessarily the best, but in the absence of alternatives, that's what's tended to come forward so far. There's a real opportunity for more thought and more work and innovation here. Um, there's, there's not been a lot of innovation, I would suggest, in thinking or practice around governing partnerships as opposed to projects. And in terms of monitoring and evaluation, we need metrics for partnerships, not just projects. We cannot accept as an article of faith either that government can do it better or that partnerships will necessarily be better, faster, or cheaper in del delivering optimal uh, returns on investment. A big question for us going forward is, what is the role of central action versus bottom-up or localized approaches? And what specifically in the realm of operational improvement is feasible and will yield greatest results? A lot of this speaks to the heart of what is the role of government. To me, the key challenges and opportunities are three. Procurement reform, innovative finance, and whole of government action, not talk. Leadership is not just about messaging and the photo op with the big check at the Clinton Global Initiative. It's about listening to external voices in analyzing operational issues and putting our most able soldiers' minds and muscle to the wheel of change. Enterprise-wide action to develop new tools and techniques will be best matched by local application in countries, regions, sectors in shaping, delivering, and celebrating partnerships that really move the needle on development. We need whole of government action leveraging whole of society, as the UCOM commander in chief refers to it, using smart financing instead of grants only money and a tired DOD procurement based procurement rule book. And the US government needs to pay to play. USAID has relaunched GDA with some fanfare, but like the uh, the G partnership initiative at state hasn't planned that I know of to allocate any new budgetary resources to it. Partnerships are not alchemy. And um, substantial and sustainable activity and results are only going to come from real investment of additive resources, making it core business, just like we want the private sector to do. 
not a hobby at the fringe. Mandating increases or new activity in this way without additional resources in the environment in which all of the development agencies work is not going to um, bring things forward. If you ask for increasing alliances or new behaviors without the, the, all, the wherewithal to do so, it becomes a creative accounting function, not a development undertaking. I'm joined this morning by some very smart panelists and dear friends who've worked on these issues and can offer insights and help set the agenda for what more study and work needs to be done. Please join me in welcoming my colleagues to the, to the podium. Drew Luton, Jerry Jensen, Dennis Whittle, and Jane Nelson. Drew is one of those injured soldiers who put his wheel and his leg, I mean his shoulder and his leg, to the wheel of development. So he's sitting on the end. How did it happen? Yeah. The answer is no more rugby. Oh, OK. Ah. <laughs> I thought it was. supposed to ask me if I ever played rugby before. <laughs> <laughs> I know the answer to that question already. No. Um, does, do you all know uh, all of these grand people? And shall I just quickly introduce them? Maybe we'll do that. Jane Nelson. Jane Nelson does so many things. Uh, she's been a banker. She has been an NGO board leader. She has done teaching. She has done uh, work at Harvard that I've been uh, pleased to be associated with. And uh, she leads the uh, Global Social Responsibility Initiative at the Kennedy School of Government. Welcome, Jane Nelson. Dennis Whittle. Um, used to be a world banker, and then he wasn't. He started Global Giving, <laughs> which is a eBay for development type uh, platform that has, um, to some extent, uh, we think, uh, turned development processes and, um, and engagement of the public with development issues on its ear in a good way. And now he's the proud father of a new, a new, yeah. new three-year-old from China. Welcome, Dennis. Yeah. Jerry Denson has a, a, a long and distinguished uh, career with government and then uh, has uh, joined the, the private sector. And she comes to you from the Initiative for Global Development, which is um, an uh, interesting opportunity to uh, aggregate uh, corporate involvement and voice and, uh, and focus it in various ways on international issues. Drew Luton also comes to us from originally lots of places but USAID, where we worked together happily for many years. And uh, he is now uh, with Booz Allen Hamilton. Um, I want to ask uh, each of the panelists a couple of questions and then uh, open it to your questions as well. Um, so maybe we'll start. Jane, are you happy to will we start with you? All right. So Jane, when we think about a lot of our conversation has been first uh, so happily with Neville Isdale talking about from the corporate perspective, why they engage in partnerships and what how they see the world. and and uh, what might be uh, the way forward for them. Uh, and then I've talked a little bit about uh, the, from the inside out in terms of government or how we see government and their, the US government and their role. Jane has a unique experience in looking at uh, the UN system and, and looking at other donors as well. And, and I wonder if you could, could comment on what from the perspective of other donors and international organizations do you see looking at AID and PEPFAR and the OGAC and the Department of State and MCC? Um, uh, are, how do you compare and contrast their experience? And what would it mean if AID and these other organizations really wanted to move forward in a significant way on partnerships? Yeah, in terms of sort of scaling and, yeah. and sustainability, mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, to me, I, I think there are sort of five um, big, big opportunity areas for USAID, state, and, and sort of US government, some of which other donors are already doing, and some of which I think the US is already leading in. And, and you touched on, on, on most of them in your opening comments, but I think they're, they're, they're worth reiterating. And the first is, if we're, if we're serious about sort of scaling, is this whole area of catalytic financing, impact investing, innovative financing, you know, whatever we want to call it, but the sort of this blended value financing models where um, you know, US government can use discrete amounts of money to catalyze 
private entrepreneurship, new technologies, et cetera, whether it's with established companies and technologies or, or new and emerging companies and technologies. And I think that you know, the work that Mara is now doing with the development innovations ventures, the, the invitation to innovation that MCC have started, the great work that, that um, Rob did at, at OPEC, you know, there are already some very good examples which just need to be developed further. I don't think we've done enough to look at the lessons. Um, well, I've certainly seen not enough public work done on the lessons from Diffid's innovation funds and challenge funds. And I think you know, some of the most interesting scaling that's happened has happened through Diffid innovation funds and, and challenge funds. So you look at their financial deepening challenge fund, which, which helped some of the catalytic financing both for M-Pesa um, and Safaricom in Kenya and Equity Bank in Kenya. Um, you know, they have another challenge fund, which is for the food retail sector. So they, they're quite specific about the, the types of challenge funds they have, which I think um, you know, helps to both focus but also provide more of a platform for potential scaling. So, so first, that, that whole area of, of, of challenge funding, creative financing. And sorry, Jane, I, would you suggest that, the, that Diffid would agree that having, first of all, challenge funds are a good thing. Secondly, having them focused either sectorally or regionally <laughs> is a lesson they've learned and would recommend to... Those that might uh, I think so. And again, I, I'm just ocean. not sure enough analysis has been done mm -hmm. to sort of compare these different types of create, creative financing models. So I think that's one of the areas we've really got to focus. And, and, and an area which we're just beginning to see emerging, and I think is great potential for US aid and the US government to take a lead, is with sovereign wealth funds. And as some of the, the you know, newly emerging countries have their own sovereign wealth funds that they want to do more in development, are there opportunities for, for financing partners there? So that's first. Very, very quickly. Secondly, um, I think there's more potential and, and GDA-led in this, in these sort of global framework agreements with companies that are either big footprint players or have scaling technologies. And uh, you, you mentioned that the Coca-Cola partnership that just won the award, where you know, that wasn't a project-based partnership. It was a strategic alliance in numerous countries around a particular area or USAID working with Chevron in Angola and now Nigeria, or working with Cisco Systems and Microsoft across a lot of countries. You know, how can we be more strategic with the companies that are, are the biggest footprint players um, and, and go beyond sort of project-based partnerships? And, and I think we can, we can learn a lot. lot, lot um, you know, and I think the leadership from the USAID side is greater there than probably other, other donors. Um, I think a third area where there's great potential, again, the US government's already played a role, but could play more of a role, is in convening these system level platforms that address systemic challenges. Um, and you know, one of the best examples that the State Department was involved with, with the British Foreign Office a number of years ago, were the voluntary principles on security and human rights, um, where you know, you've got groups of companies together to address a systems challenge that, that no one could address on their own or the Extractive Industries Transparency Initiative, or Neville mentioned the, you know, the round table on sustainable palm oil, or the, you know, the Global Alliance on Clean Cook Stoves. So I think these coalitions can both help to sort of improve the enabling environment and or they can make market systems work better in a particular challenge area. And so I think that convening role of government, um, you know, which the UN has done reasonably well, but I think bilateral governments can, can do even better often, is, is, is another area of potential. Um, fourthly, and you, you mentioned it, these sort of um, technology innovation platforms, and I'll leave Dennis to sort of pick up on that, but, but actually using um, you know, technology as a platform to facilitate innovation, um, you know, co you know, competitive bid challenges on particular technologies, et cetera, where anyone in the world can, can apply and, and, and we can get ideas from everywhere, mm -hmm. and we can also source finance and, and, and technologies from, from, from anywhere. So, so technology platforms is the, is the fourth one. And then the fifth, and you mentioned it, I think there's great potential to do more in specific countries around a sort of not only whole of US government, but whole of donor community. And so as part of the, the, the whole aid effectiveness agenda, the sort of country ownership agenda. And I think we've got four great countries with the Partnership for Growth where there's a strong domestic private sector, there's quite a lot of foreign investment, there's reasonable coordination both within the US government but also between the US and other donors. And then I think the potential to just focus on those four countries and see well, what could we do to work with the domestic organized private sector as well as some of the key foreign investors in Ghana, Tanzania, El Salvador and the Philippines and see if we can have a, a more joined up platform in, in just those four countries would be another interesting way to just explore new opportunities for scaling. You know, South Africa has a great model called the Business Trust where there's sort of six government ministers, six corporate CEOs have come together around a sort of shared development agenda 
And you know, there's a few other models like that around the world. And could we experiment with that at the country level where business is you know, part of the creation and, and sort of setting a, a, a development strategy for the country, but the donor community helping to facilitate that? Mm -hmm. And I think you know, the US government could play a very, very important role, certainly in those four countries. Excellent uh, range of examples and suggestions. Thank you for that, Jane. And it also brings forward this tension between the global and the local. When our framework agreements or broad uh, partnerships that are multi-country or, or issue specific that span the globe utilized and when is the deep dive where a lot of US government assets are organized on a decentralized and country specific basis and how to, how to marry the two. Well, Dennis, from the perspective of uh, both your work at the World Bank and um, why did you leave the World Bank anyway? I don't remember. OK, all right. Um, and the, the, the work that you did with, uh, for the last 10 years, it's right. also the anniversary of, of global giving, right. I think, right. and, uh, and your graduation from there. Right. Um, uh, you've suggested that this is somewhat of a paradigm shift, and you probably don't use that corny language, but in terms of uh, of rethinking um, who's smart and who cares and how do you bring them together and, and, and make more from, mm -hmm. from uh, work that can address global issues. Do you want to tell us a little yeah. bit about what you've learned and okay. what you think the US government could perhaps do more in partnership? Well, in response to your question about, uh, is this on, by the way? It's okay. About why I left the World Bank, uh, uh, most of us here who have been in the aid business for many years uh, remember it when it was constructed around the idea that you needed to bring experts together and expert agencies to study the world's problems and come up with the answers to the problems and fund the problems and implement the problems. And in the late 1990s, uh, Jim Wolfenson, the president of the World Bank, uh, asked me and a couple other people to experiment with different ways of finding solutions to the world's problems. And so we created something called the Development Marketplace where for the first time we allowed anyone in the world with a good idea, without regard to who you were, to come into the atrium of the World Bank, pitch your idea to a jury panel, not only of World Bank experts, but uh, Daimler Chrysler, uh, Save the Children, and World Bank uh, experts together, and, uh, and buy for funding. And the, the outcome of the $5 million that we spent on that event in 2000, I believe, was greater than the outcome of a billion dollars I had just spent in Russia through the top-down mm -hmm. uh, methods. So long story short, a couple of us uh, decided to leave the World Bank and create a market try to create this marketplace where anybody in the world could propose an idea and anybody in the world could help fund the idea. You didn't have to be an aid specialist. And this, seems like, this seemed like a crazy idea at the time. And we were, uh, uh, it was pretty lonely out there until we ran into Holly. <laughs> over at USAID who said, you know what, I've been thinking along the same lines and, and I, I want to help you guys get this up to speed and running. And so Holly and her colleagues at GDA uh, provided about a million dollars of funding to Global Giving at the beginning. And we've now uh, leveraged that to raise over 70, 70 75 million dollars from 220,000 individual donors and probably 50 or 60 corporations. They have all bonded together to fund 5,000 projects in 100 countries in the last few years. So hopefully very good return on investment. Couple things picking up on what you said and what we've learned. Uh, first, I want to talk about the whole of government approach. I just ran over here from the World Bank where there's a meeting going on on impact investing. And when I saw Mora over here, I was reminded how hard it is for World Bank and USA just to talk about these things. Mm -hmm. And uh, 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 whole of government is also whole of aid agencies as well. And one of the big issues is breaking down these boundaries and getting the procurement situation under control. And uh, this is, sounds trivial and it is fundamental to progress in the field. So I, we could have a whole session on that. I won't bore people with that, but it's really critical. The second thing that's really struck me is how the businesses we work with bring a new mentality of risk taking and innovation to the table. It takes 58 ideas in a company on average to result in one successful product, to get one successful product to the market. 
And companies just know this, and so they're constantly ideating and trying things and experimenting th things. And a lot of things don't work. A lot of products don't work. That's okay. Stop it. Do something different. Get feedback from the market. Stop it. Do something different. Don't kill the people that tried it. Encourage people to try things. Uh, very different mentality. But if and it took you three years to design the project and four years to procure it, and then you're going, that's a little bit of a there's a the clock speed of that to, is uh, just too yeah. it's too great. Right. And uh, I'm so struck by our corporate partners, Dell, Ford, you know, Gap, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, how they will try things on global giving. And if it doesn't work, they don't abandon it. They just try it again. It's really striking to me coming out of the aid business. Finally, uh, and this is what I want to emphasize, is what I believe is a fundamental shift happening, and Neville alluded to it in his, in his talk, with business. Originally, we had sort of greenwashing. You put your people that you couldn't fire into foundations and <laughs> had them do, you know, the fancy brochures. <laughs> you know it. Then came something a little bit more sophisticated, corporate social responsibility, which is the idea that sort of the anti-Friedman idea that corporations had to give back to society. And then most recently, w uh, we've seen some big successes with what Neville described as kind of strategic uh, investing in your supply chain, essentially. Well, water is a fantastic example of that for Coke. I think the next th phase that's coming is meaning. About 25 or 30 years ago, Peter Drucker said, there are now hundreds of millions of people in the world who have enough stuff. Physical consumption of stuff is no longer the constraint on welfare for hundreds of millions of people. And he said in his sort of uh, uh, way that most people, including me, couldn't understand back, back then. Meaning is the binding constraint on happiness and will be the binding constraint for markets in the future. And when I first read this, I thought, that's kind of crazy. And yet, I assume that you are here because it's meaningful. Here's a guy who uh, uh, rose lives to Lives in Barbados. Lives in Barbados. Sakes. He's <laughs> risen to the heights of corporate uh, of, of corporate life. He doesn't need to be here, but presumably, and I, we haven't met, so I'm just guessing, he's here because it provides meaning for his life. You're right. And I'm seeing this in so many of the companies we work with where companies are having trouble attracting and maintaining employees if the employees aren't doing something meaningful. And your colleague, Indra Nui, a couple of years ago when they launched the Pepsi Refresh program, Pepsi was giving away $20 million, less strategically from your point of view, um, but uh, giving away $20 million domestically. She got up at the launch dinner with her lieutenants, her top managers, and she gave the business case for it. She gave the, the, the branding case for it, et cetera. But at the end of her speech to her top managers, who are these tough guys, most of them are tough guys, she said, but I just want to say one more thing. She said, I had dinner last night with my 26-year-old daughter who works for Environmental Defense Fund. And I told her what I was going to be doing today. And for the first time in my life, my daughter looked up at me and she said, Mom, I'm really proud of you. I'm proud of what you're doing. And Indra, who's a tough cookie herself, said, you know, that really hit me like a freight train. She, my daughter was proud of what I was doing. And there was not a dry eye among these tough guys in the house when she said that. And she was doing her best to align Pepsi with, the, with meaning for her employees and for her staff. We are also seeing this with customers. Customers don't want to just buy commodities anymore. They increasingly, they care about the fact that Coke is doing good out there. That's part of Coke's brand. And uh, Nike today just launched a big uh, a competition around the girl effect uh, that we're working with them on. And Nike's done its homework and they know that investing in girls around the world has the highest development returns you can probably have. And so they're trying to align their brand around that and they're helping uh, match money that their clients are giving and uh, basically uh, help their clients, their customers, access something meaningful. So meaning is the new frontier, I think. And it, I, Ten years ago, I would have said that was too soft of a term and, you know, it's kind of wonky or whatever. Now we have the former CEO and chairman of Coke sitting right in the front row giving a 
speech like that at a conference like this, and I really think it marks a big turning point. So, so that was wonderful. Thank you. The, so what should government do? If you've got this platform that uh, allows people, companies, and others to come forward and click and pay to uh, causes and, and uh, individuals that they, they want to support, um, is there an interface? Or does this mean that government should get out of the way? Well, I think what GDA did to facilitate what I just mm -hmm. described is got to be one of the highest returns I've ever seen on an aid, on an aid dollar. Mm -hmm. And you all came in at that point with risk capital. Global giving was this fledgling little idea with three circles on a sheet of paper. I mean, it's embarrassing now to think about it. We went and we talked to Let Holly. me be clear. They didn't get a million dollars for three circles no, no, on that's a sheet of paper. Yeah, <laughs> right. <laughs> right, Jim? <laughs> yeah, no, I remember Jim. No, by, by, the time we, by the time we met Jim, we were in. No, but at the beginning. But at, seriously, at the beginning, and I, I, I can't overemphasize this, to, to, to have an agency and people within the agency that are willing to nurture things to get it to the point where it's not just three circles on a sheet of paper so it can pass Jim's muster, um, uh, is incredibly valuable and catalytic. Mm. And it depends on people. Yeah. This happened because you were there, Holly, and then Dan followed, and Jim was, you guys were operating on the same wavelength with different strengths, and Jim's watching the back of the agency, which is his job. You're out there pushing, pushing, pushing. It's, it was about the people involved. And you can have as many innovation funds as you want, et cetera. If you don't have the right people running them, you will not have innovation. You will have bureaucracy. And so government can do it by hiring the right people, uh, first and foremost and helping develop facilities that allows those people to express some of the support for things. Well, that's, that's uh, great to, to hear that, that leadership is good. Um, it, I would suggest it's probably not sufficient. And uh, Drew, maybe jump to you for a second to talk about, well, um, like the Marines, um, we need a few good fixes. Um, uh, what, uh, what in particular do you see as the constraints to government being a better partner and or doing this partnership work with, uh, with more uh, agility and, and impact. Thanks. I'm not, I'm not going to let you turn away from leadership quite yet, um, because I think leadership drives uh, how operational decision making um, will take place and how it falls in line. I think it's very, very important that leadership take a stand and say we want certain things done or to organize a strategy and set priorities so that the people that run the organization day to day, week to week, can fall in line behind it. And then the question is, do the, does the framework of rules, regulations, laws, culture support going in leadership's direction? And, and the answer that we found with GDA was yes to an extent. But it wouldn't have happened. It wouldn't have happened if there hadn't been leadership saying, we want to do this. It started with, actually, before uh, Andrew Natsios arrived, with Don Presley and, and Secretary Powell, and then uh, Andrew Nazios picked it up in a big way and, 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 and you know, provided uh, you all with the ability to do the types of things that Dennis said. There, was, there, was re there were resources available, and there was a willingness following direction from leadership to make it happen. I say this because the people that run organizations from a contract, contracting officer perspective, program planning perspective, legal perspective, they, it, at least in the U.S. aid context, and it's the case for other organizations, they're all busy doing everything else that they're supposed to do. And unless they're told, unless the priorities are established, it, 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 um, uh, it, it's, it's, it's hard to turn the attention to how to, how to carry out those priorities. So um, an example of this uh, that happened, it actually happened before GDA. It happened with respect to the U.S. government contribution to the Gavi Alliance back in about 2000, early 2001. Uh, this was a high-level commitment from the government, uh, from the U.S. government, to contribute to the Gates Foundation-led alliance. The Gates Foundation was putting up $750 million for um, uh, this, this vaccine uh, program. Uh, the U.S. government contribution was going to be 50 or 60 million dollars a year, but Gavi looked all different. Uh, it was, was we were giving money to the Gates Foundation. Well, no, not exactly. It was this multi-party initiative. It took, it took, you know, someone from on high saying, go do it. Go make it happen. Go figure out how to do it. Work within your existing, the existing way you think about things. 
and, and, and make it happen. We did it, we did it legally, and, and so on. So it's, um, I, I just, I say that because it is important that to push what can be gotten from the system as, as far as possible, as, as much as possible. Um, I tend to think, stepping back from that, how far can you push within the existing system? I, I tend to think that there's, having just said all that, and that's important to make progress, um, it's important to understand that federal agencies, when they award contracts, when they award grants, they're operating not just in a framework of rules and regulations that they made up themselves. They are working in a framework of rules and regulations that come from OMB, that come from the Congress, that are government-wide uh, uh, requirements. And it's, it's difficult to operate, where, while we, where we were able to do a lot, it's difficult to do everything that we've been talking about here um, uh, and, and that the report talks about and that we envision as possible um, if, if we're within that framework. For that reason, I think it's gonna take some, again, leadership saying this, here's what we wanna achieve and then crafting some exceptions um, in policy and legislation that will be above the agency level to say this is what we want you to do and go do it. And as you were saying, resources and staff to do it because um, you know, uh, uh, permission to do things is one thing, greater permission to have more latitude to, to, to relate in a world where technology and, and uh, you know, uh, uh, breaking down of stovepipes among sectors is, 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 uh, is, uh, is, uh, is, is new and continues to, to reinvent itself is one thing. Permission is one thing, but you know, people that are charged with going to do it and some flexible resources. Dennis wouldn't have gotten his grant if they hadn't uh, set aside some money up front for the public for the global Divine development alliance initiative to look for good opportunities so uh, uh, that's a long way of saying we can do a lot within the system but you can't expect it to get take it all the way and i think it's going to take some thinking about what those changes will be in the context of what the priorities are and what the strategy is okay so the potential for some whole of government innovation around the uh the business processes, and uh, uh, I, I think that that's an important, uh, important message. Um, in, in terms of representing both government and the private sector, that's a, not a hard job, huh? Um, the, um, when you were at NCC, I know you, you tried to advance um, more private sector collaboration. Some, some would suggest that that's difficult when there's a lot of money on the table already, and when it's a government-to-government -government type relationship, and and uh, the private sector, to some extent, understands the vendor signals. They don't understand so much other things. And now in your role with working with private sector organizations, uh, you see an opportunity to, to sort of aggregate demand or, or focus it and, and um, also do some lifting for government. And how's that going? Or what specifically do you see as, as something which, which government could do more and differently in order to enhance these partnerships with the private sector. Oh, great, thank you, thank you so much. Uh, I, I, you know, first of all, I just want to thank you and Dan for writing this long overdue study Mark. and, oops. <laughs> um, and asking the, this very important question that you posed, why is it that we have political buy-in from the president on down to do to make partnerships a more fundamental part of our development strategy and why is it when we have a number an increasing number of companies interested in using partnerships as an entry strategy in frontier markets why is it that it's still somewhat marginal activity in uh, government agencies and what i want to do is actually take it to the 2.0 level and and ask the next question why is it that the types of the partnerships that we're seeing are not necessarily what folks in this room would consider partnership nirvana in terms of scalability, uh, replicability, sustainability. And what I want to do is pose a theory and then walk through the thinking of a company that's genuinely interested in doing this to try to illustrate uh, what I'm trying to get at here. And the theory is that even though there's clear recognition among the development agencies on the, the private sector is good, the uh, broad-based economic growth is a, is, a, is a worthy policy priority, the dots still have not been connected between our development programs and what we know are the most potent drivers of economic growth, 
which are foreign direct investment and trade. I would argue that you can't get to scalable, sustainable, replicable, unless you engage the core business of a company's strategy. And you can't do that, the government can't do that, unless their tools and models are set up to attract private capital. And the models that we have right now aren't built for that. Um, they're still holding the private sector at arm's length. They, to a large degree, there's no process built in to bring them in on the ground floor of uh, project development. There is still, interestingly, I, I would say, no um, concerted effort to highlight the sustainable, the uh, commercially viable opportunities. Um, and I think the tools that the government has at the ready to do this really are still stuck. They're not particularly creative, they're not flexible, they're not coordinated, and they're not targeted in a way to help a company actually, um, to provide the tipping point for a company to make an investment, the commercial investments, the commercially viable investments that we're trying to talk about here. So I, I would even go so far as to say that um, there is no silver bullet, obviously, but if the government were to start acting like a minority shareholder, the minority shareholder that it is, that a lot of these bureaucratic obstacles would start to dissolve. Mm. So let me illustrate with the thinking of a company, and this is a company that is willing to take the long view, is willing to um, take lower profit margins for some period of time, willing to take uh, greater risk, willing to experiment with new models to get at the bottom of the pyramid, but is looking at uh, an, an opportunity with the U.S. government as a way of, of creating a market, of actually leveraging resources. The first thing they hope is that the questions that the government is asking are the right questions, the right set of questions. And rather than having the, the company try to fit its strategy into a set agenda, a set government agenda that is, is set in stone, that they are actually asking the question, how can what the private sector is doing already, how can the government increase the developmental impact of that particular investment? So looking at ex having room in the model for existing corporate strategies um, and the synergies that can, that can be created between U.S. government and corporate strategies. And following versus leading. Exactly, exactly. Mm -hmm. And that implies a number of things. That implies a different set of expectations in the conversations with our country partners, um, an expectation that they will look towards sustainable partnerships, an expectation that they'll leverage the resources where they can, and providing the resources to help them do that, not just telling them to do it, but giving them the ammunition in order to do it in the same way that the government expects that procurement practices will be squeaky clean, that there'll be monitoring and evaluation, that there'll be progressive gender policies. The U.S. government puts their money where their mouth is on those priorities, but they haven't quite gotten to that point with the private sector. Um, it also implies this systematic process that holds hands with the, with the company from the beginning to the end in the project development process, and that's still the, uh, um, the enlightened individuals in the government agencies that we all know and love are trying very hard to do this, but they still quite haven't gotten there yet. Uh, but the hope springs eternal with uh, the Partnership for Growth countries and, and the Second Compact countries. Um, that means greater reliance on informal advisory groups, which I think can do a number of things. First, it can point toward these sustainable uh, investment opportunities. It can get at this very important conversation that is still largely lacking, where the company says, I will make an investment here, but for that. And that gives the government the information they need so they can target their resources in a way to attract the private capital. Um, it also, I, I think largely overlooked, can be a very effective policy prod. Um, if you have the private sector at the table, I think there's nothing more uh, compelling to a government that is genuinely interested in bringing investment into their country to have an agency with a checkbook coupled with a couple of investors at the ready that are willing to make an investment um, if particular regulatory issues are addressed. The second thing that a co this hypothetical company wants to see is they want to, they are hoping that the government is thinking in terms of opportunities and not just constraints. 
And there's, there's a couple of issues there. Um, first, there's the question of just finding the bloody opportunities. You know, that there's a transparency issue. And I know both MCC and USAID ha solicit for partnerships. But I think you all point out in the paper that a f that, that may not go all the way for a Fortune 100 company. That, that, may, not, that may, be, may be the beginning of wisdom, but it's not the end. Um, but I think there's actually a more fundamental, a structural impediment um, insofar as the commercially viable opportunities may not appear at all. And I'm, I'm talking about MCC here, but my, I'm, I'm a little nervous because the same model is being replicated in Partnership for Growth Countries as well. And that is that the, the <coughs> once countries decide what sector they're going to invest in, um, how they're going to use the resources, they go through what is called a constraints analysis, the most binding constraints to macroeconomic growth. And the operative word there is macroeconomic. And nine times out of 10, what results from that analysis are public infrastructure projects. It is no coincidence that the $8 billion that MCC has committed in the last seven years has been largely not leveraged with the private sector. And it's because there have not been a, a number of commercially viable projects to work with in the first place. Um, so the, the, um, what's needed is to, um, I'm, I'm not, now let me just be very clear. I'm not saying that there's no need for the government to play a role in public infrastructure projects. There, everyone knows that's a major constraint, and of course they should go there. But if we have, as a policy goal, sustainable partnerships, there needs to be room in the business model to try to find commercially viable opportunities. And right now, it just doesn't exist in that particular model. What, now, it's not uh, that difficult to fix. I think you can, again, back to an informal advisory process. I think if you have this conversation, if you, um, if you um, supplement the constraints analysis with real-time information on what it will take for a, a company to invest alongside a development priority, it can go a long way. The third thing company, uh, now, so let's assume that a company has found an opportunity, it's participated in a process, and it's structuring a partnership. The next thing they need is risk mitigation. And again, the tools are there in the U.S. government, um, but they're not targeted in a way that can actually be this tipping point that a company is looking for in order to make that investment decision. And um, I'm, when I'm Talking about risk mitigation, it's anything from uh, capacity building to first loss guarantees to just knowing where the bloody road is going to go so a company can invest alongside it. And um, it, it's, it's very difficult for a company. And, and most of the time, I think, um, um, let me go back to our hypothetical company. Um, they're interested in sourcing from a feed the future value chain. But what they need is the behind the gate, uh, behind the farmer's gate, capacity building that can get at some of their <laughs> volume and quality issues that they need to solve in order to get these products to market. And they're not particularly confident that they could just go to the government and get that help that could be targeted to their specific investment. And I think part of that is a cultural issue. I, you know, there's a, it's anathema for uh, the government to be helping one particular company that's going to be making a, a return on their investment. We still haven't gotten over that hurdle. Um, and then the, the, the last thing, uh, oh, well, wait, let me fantasize for a minute. <laughs> and <laughs> there's, there's one other dimension to the risk mitigation aspect, and that is that, God forbid, the tools, the, the tools that the government has would actually be coordinated across the government and coordinated up front. I, I know I'm, it, this is a, it's She's a, a wild girl. Yeah, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Um, but let's just say that uh, for an energy investment in Ghana or Tanzania, that you could combine a USTDA feasibility study with an MCC grant that could bring down the tariff structure to make the project more commercially viable with some targeted capacity building that could um, uh, be very appropriate for the project. And then you put that in an RFP and you went out to the private sector. I, could, I bet you dollars to donuts you will get a number of interested uh, companies in participating and leveraging that, develop, that uh, investment that would enhance its developmental impact. Um, and then the last thing is the hope that there would be a focus on uh, the demand side of the equation in all of this. 
And there, I think we've seen a number of times that if you have buyer guarantees, if you have a buyer already set up in a particular market, we've seen it with Cargill, we've seen it with ADM, we've seen it with Costco, that then the rest of the supply chain, it's not, a, it, it's not easy, but it's much easier to, uh, for the rest of the supply chain to fall into place, especially the critical link of financing. So, the, and there's been a number of examples where it's worked. It's, there's also been examples where it, it, it hasn't even been tried, and there have been real implications, I think, for um, the um, number of beneficiaries uh, that resulted from a particular project. Um, mm. So I'll stop there. Great. Yeah. Well, uh, she tells a compelling story from the firm perspective about what it takes, and, and among other things, uh, this, this uh, interagency or whole the government response and having a, uh, risk mitigation and bringing you closer to the process and engaging early. Um, it, you also talk about the, the, the concern that government has about uh, picking winners or, or uh, implicit subsidies, and some of it has to do with process and some of it has to do with culture of, of engaging with the for-profit sector. Um, one of the things that, that you spoke to indirectly is this advisory function. and. Uh, a lot of government uh, agencies um, are constrained by FACAs, and, and you have a happy day if you don't know what a FACA is, but it's, uh, <laughs> it's basically an advisory, it's an authority to have an advisory body, um, because you're not supposed to just call up the private sector and talk to them directly. Um, and uh, the, But this consultation and how do you invite others in and have that conversation, what spaces do you do it in and how do you do it safely is, is certainly a going forward concern. Um, most importantly, I think you talk about the listening and, and the early engagement. So we want to listen to you and, and hear some of your input and questions to the panelists. So we'll pass around the mic if there are a couple of folks that want to raise their hands. Who has the mic? There's, there's a question there. Um, it's on. Um, good morning. Thank you again also to CSIS for organizing. My name is Julia Roig, and I work for um, an international NGO called Partners for Democratic Change. And I'd, I'd actually like to hear the panel discuss a little bit more about that third leg of the triangle. Um, because I do think that the aspect of partnerships um, and civil society organizations needing to be a part of the agenda setting um, is very important, especially with regards to the lack of confidence um, and mistrust in many of the countries that we work in. Um, and, and I would also like to ask a little bit, I know that we're kind of at a, a bird's eye view in this discussion, but in our experience, um, the really effective partnerships are when we're providing access and convening power at this country level mm -hmm. um, with GE's local operations and the local NGO, not the international NGO, yeah. and the local government working together to set the agenda. So I'd like to hear maybe just briefly about that, because I don't think it was touched upon in the initial comments. Thank okay. you. So anyone want to comment on the third sector? Yeah, I mean, I, I absolutely, absolutely agree with you. And I think one of the areas where um, your USAID and, and US government in general and other donors have been able to help is, you know, Neville mentioned the Round Table on Sustainable Palm Oil, actually funding World Wildlife Fund in this case, but you know, it could be any NGO to provide that convening space and a relatively neutral space for companies to come together with governments and, and other NGOs. The voluntary principles was the same thing, EITI was the same thing. So I think funding international NGOs to provide platforms for, for multi-stakeholder collaboration is, is one way. I think sort of secondly, actually building the capacity of the domestic NGOs so that they are better able to engage with business and in, indeed with their own governments. So I think some of the work that the US government's done on, on transparency, you know, supporting domestic NGOs in countries on budget transparency in country is a great example um, of, of, of sort of the donor agencies building the capacity of NGOs in a way that improves the overall enabling environment in that country, not only for a, you know, hopefully sort of more open society, but certainly for a better enabling environment for business. So that would just be you know, sort of, uh, you know, two, two examples. But I think that local capacity building of local NGOs and local business associations, producer associations, um, which are 
constitute as NGOs, you know, smallholder farmer associations, I think is an, an, another area where you know, the donors can play an incredibly important role to enable those small farmer associations or small entrepreneur associations to link with the Cargills and the GEs and the Coca-Colas. So those just be some, some thoughts, but I absolutely agree with you. Great. OK, we have another question at the back. Oh, I'm sorry, there's Mike here. Yes, um, I work in the private sector, and this has been a wonderful discussion on the overarching uh, issues that we face at the policy level and the strategic level. My question has to do more with a nuts and bolts uh, solution to uh, my corporation has come up with what we believe to be a, um, a very viable uh, public-private partnership idea. However, the resistance that we're receiving from a Department of State point of view, um, and, and, I'm, and the reason for the question is I'm hoping Mr. Estelle, as, as well as you all, can answer the question about strategies to deal with a level of mistrust or um, uh, a concern that our motives are strictly driven by profit. Um, you know, with your bottling company, uh, you know, building something there that, that, that has, we're willing to take, as you said, the risk of a long-term investment uh, for return on the other end, but we're running into resistance that says, well, you're only doing this because you want to make a buck. Mm -hmm. um, do you have any ideas for dealing with that sort of a, uh, a focus? Well, first of all, you know, get over it. There's a little bit of... Uh, uh, I, I would suggest that um, you're going to hear that, and and uh, and you will hear it again, and you'll hear it even in the best of circumstances. There, there are those that um, people who work for the government generally work for the government for a reason. It's because they've they have chosen to do that. They know how to do that. It may be part of a chapter, but but basically, um, there's a lot that uh, that uh, makes them. Um, uh, concerned about uh, the, the motives of others and particularly with the strong uh, regulatory uh, framework in which they operate. It, um, so they don't come by it um, uh, except through a lot of, of, of training and, and, um, and admonishments. Um, I, I think that, that, that part of it is, um, is the, the language that we have to that we have to develop in terms of being able to articulate what this win-win concept. Um, if you go in and talk about who you are and don't talk about who we could be together, um, uh, that's, that's not going to advance very much the understanding. And so I think that, that the, the conversation about, well, what, is, what are the metrics going to be? What is success going to look like? What is going to be more as opposed to that which you could do by yourself uh, otherwise, the presumption is that there's subsidy, that this is picking favorites, that this is uh, inappropriate, and it's not, it's not government's core function. It's not their responsibility. So I think part of it, and that's, again, a very general answer, but is to be able to define what the alignment is with what MCC or AID or the Department of State is really all about. And, and in most cases, it's there. It's just, a, it's just important and incumbent upon those that are coming to government to describe what it, what it looks like. I, I, I'd add, I mean, it's exactly that. It's, it's being able to explain how you're advancing a, a public purpose in what you propose and, and how you'll know that you have when you have done that and explaining that in, in all of its ramifications. The other is, is that if you're proposing to do this on a contract basis with the government, it's very hard to do a a non-competed contract, uh, if it's of any size, and that'll be a challenge for them as well. So, so think about just just think about how you're approaching that. But it is what is the overlap? They're they're there to carry out a public purpose. How are you helping the State Department in this case carry out the purpose that they are charged with carrying out? And and if your argument, if your if your approach supports that, then they ought to hopefully be willing to at least listen. Uh, and profit's a good thing because profit sustains right. activity, uh, uh, maybe even more of the same. So. They need you to be a going concern, yeah. and uh, yeah. it needs to be, uh, it needs to make sense for you, not just to be a philanthropic activity if you're well positioned with them. Please. Exactly. Hello, I'm, my name is Andrea McDaniel, and I'm with the Aspen Institute, and we are organizing a public-private partnership that focuses on 
job creation and entrepreneurship in North Africa. So we're building a coalition of uh, private sector partners and foundations to do that. And um, uh, our model is locally driven, locally owned, where we are asking uh, local organizations in North Africa to identify projects that need U.S. support. And given that we're a public-private partnership, we are, uh, we were seated by the U.S. State Department and continue to have a, an, an active role. We're hearing from our, uh, our local partners that there is, a, uh, there is a real desire to have U.S. private sector expertise, we understand entrepreneurship and job creation, but there's a reticence to be affiliated sometimes with the U.S. government. And um, there's uh, sometimes that's rightfully so, other times it's just a, a generalized suspicion because of not knowing. I'm wondering if the panel has any, any thoughts about um, the role of the U.S. government in public-private partnerships given the public diplomacy challenges of the current day. And by the way, for those of you who are interested, uh, 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 unabashed uh, plug, we are hosting a conference in Marrakesh where we're looking at public-private partnerships in Morocco and all of North Africa that's taking place in January and you can contact me to, to learn more about that and we're recruiting people to go and participate with us but I'm curious to hear the the panel's thoughts about um, the, the role of the US government given public diplomacy challenges. Mm -hmm. right. I guess, Jane, you might want to mention sort of from outside government. Uh, yeah. I think a lot of times we hear at the World Economic Forum or elsewhere, um, companies like Coke saying, people forget that we aren't the US government. Or in other words, we're carrying, uh, um, our, our brand is very, uh, has the flag wrapped around it. And, yeah. and with that comes challenges and opportunities. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, I, I guess as a sort of the, the non-American here on the, on, on the panel, I mean, it, it, yeah, there clearly is a challenge. I'm not sure there's. A, you know, an easy answer. Um, I think, I think one of the ways to get around it again is that you know, emphasizing that local ownership piece as much as possible, both the you know, the local government, but the local business community and and, and NGO community, um, and then also you know partnering with with other donors. And and again, we're, you know, it's hard enough to have whole of government you know, within the country, let alone with with other donors. But I think those are the you know the the, the, the two best strategies for. For, for addressing that mm -hmm. and as much as possible I think also working with local academic partners I mean we've talked a little bit about academic partners today but um, you know, I, I think they also help to sometimes to sort of diffuse um, sensitivities on the on the political and for the public diplomacy front and, and just being you know sensitive to, to the issue which you clearly mm -hmm. are very good I thought no I would just add that um, we've been talking about how the private sector is adding sustainability to the US government activity but it, it can work the other way as well I mean, it's, there's, yeah. it, there's also um, the value that the government brings, both the local government and the U.S. government, to the sustainability of a particular partnership. Um, so th you know, that, that's definitely something that should be highlighted, as well as the risk mitigation dimension to it. Yeah. Great. Well, I would suggest to you that um, uh, there are uh, U.S. government representatives here uh, today um, they are, uh, they're interested in, in reform, they're interested in doing the right thing, they're interested in engaging with the private sector, um, they are listening. And um, we have, I, I want to thank them for their, uh, for their, first of all, sharing about what the constraints are in which, uh, in w where they currently operate and how they plan on moving forward. Um, uh, but also their, their continued willingness to be in this conversation and, and to take on board uh, your suggestions. We have um, an agenda of work ahead of us in terms of being able to, as a third party um, advocate, uh, suggest ways in which we all can pull up our socks or do things more or do things less. Um, um, but want to thank them for their openness and, and their, um, uh, their willingness and thank them for their service. And I want to uh, also thank my, uh, my colleagues and panelists for, um, for their perspectives and their willingness to be involved in these operations going forward as well. It's, an, it's important work. We're not done. We're just sort of getting going. And I think there's, there's a lot of, of exciting impact uh, that we can look forward to in the future. And uh, Dan, do you want to say anything in closing? All right. Read the report and um, stay in touch with us in terms of thoughts that you have going forward. Thanks Thank so very you. much. Thank you, Holly.